呃，大家好，呃，我是伸展，呃、uh, ，Hi everyone， 呃、uh, ，I'm 伸展，嗯、um, ，I'm sitting at China Institute. I'm in charge of the educational programs at China Institute. A lot of old friends here. Welcome back to Lunch and Learn, uh, and also to new friends. Welcome if it's your first time. I'm here with my colleague Yong Qiang. 永强在哪里？永强在这里，在这里。大家好，我是永强。啊、嗯呃，你好。哦、呃，我也在 China Institute 华美协进社。Yeah, Yong Qiang is sitting uh just down the hallway, uh in the in the office. So we are currently we're back. Uh, and as I mentioned a little earlier, we are going to have in-person programs, and we are planning, in fact, for our second literati salon. Um, perhaps in uh, June. So stay tuned. Uh, it will be a wonderful extension of our online experience of lunch and learn. Uh, so may I, if if you if it's the first time for you to come to lunch and learn, would you please raise your hand? Oh, Eugenia, ni hao. Welcome. Uh, or yeah, Nancy, I can see either online or yeah. Sorry, I cannot say every name, but I can see quite a few hands up uh, for new friends joining us today. Uh, this is a session that we really uh, provide a brief window to Chinese culture through poetry. It's one poem at one time. This is a monthly series. And through that poem, we get into the language, etymology, writing, Chinese culture, or just art and culture in general. Uh, we please, um, I have to remind everyone, uh, during the session, uh, you may mute yourself as well. We will read aloud together. Uh, so we have quite some participants joining us today, just to ensure we all have an uninterrupted experience. The chat box, feel free to raise your questions or comments. Uh, during the session, I uh, write down uh, anything that will related to the program. Uh, Yong Qiang, Lin Lao Shi here is monitoring uh, uh, the chat box. So we will be also interactive in that way. How the, I will try to speak both English and Chinese. Uh, sometimes I forget because uh, it's always well pressing in terms of time to finish everything during one hour, but the sequence is we will look into one poem. Uh, at the beginning, we will read aloud together. You will read after me word by word, line by line, <coughs> and we will spend a little bit time talking about the poem. And then there's a little bit of a uh, writing part that we will pick one character to write together. So if you have a pen or brush or paper, uh, handy next to you, that will be great. 好的,那我们就开始今天的Lunchandlearn. Now let's get started. I will share my screen. 今天我们要读的是春晓,孟浩然. So this is the poem we are reading today. Chun Xiao by a Tang Dynasty. Again, we read a lot of Tang poet, poetry. A Tang Dynasty poet, Meng Hao Ran. As you can see, Meng Hao Ran is in, was born in early Tang Dynasty, not too early, but he is one of the most influential poets in early Tang Dynasty. He's about 10 years older than Li Bai and Wang Wei, both of these great poets we have read before during our sessions. And if you're interested, you can look into our YouTube channel or the Lunch and Learn webpage to see the poems we read written by Li Bai and Wang Wei. And also, while uh, Meng Hao Ran is known to be friend with Wang Wei, since we do have his poems written for Wang Wei, uh, it's called Liu Bie Wang Wei to like 
keep and stay with me, Wang Wei, as Wang Wei is saying goodbye to him in one occasion. And Meng Haoran was also admired by Li Bai. As we, uh, many of us know, Li Bai as one of the greatest Tang Dynasty poets. Um, he showed his admiration to Meng Haoran by, by writing some poems to Meng Haoran. As well, we read one, uh, Song Meng Haoran, Zhi Guanglin, uh, Huang He Lou, Song Meng Haoran, Zhi Guanglin. That's, I think, about last spring. Uh, farewell to Meng Haoran. Um, so and we read Tao Yuanming before from Jin Dynasty, a poet in the um, fourth century uh, that Meng Haoran's poem actually reminds me a lot of Tao Yuanming. And it's a great connection between Tao Yuanming and Li Bai. That is to seek the essence of life in nature by celebrating a solitary lifestyle that distant oneself from the world. So today's Chunxiao may provide a small example. It's a very brief quatrain, as we will see very shortly. I do want to mention that the translation is cho chosen from Francois Cheng by the Chinese name Cheng Baoyi. He's a French, American, uh, French Chinese sinologist, as well as a poet himself from his book, Chinese Poetic Writing. So the translation was originally in French and was translated from French to Chinese by Jerome Seton, a, uh, a sinologist and also translator professor from, I believe, uh, University of, uh, yeah, it slipped to my mind, <laughs> sorry about that. But there is a little bit of, of transition from different languages to get to this point of this translation. I will read the entire poem once, so we will get a sense of how the sound uh, is like. And I would invite you to also uh, take a look at the translation while reading and listening to the poem. Of course, well, if you're muted, you can follow with me while I'm reading. And if it's new to you, don't worry, I will go, we will go together word by word after this page. Now what you I will start from the title. Chun Xiao. Chun Xiao. Chun Mian Bu Jue Xiao. Bu Jue Xiao. Chu Chu Wen Ti Niao. Ye Lai Feng Yu Sheng. Ye Lai Feng. Hua Luo. 知多少? That's it, the entire poem, four lines, 20 characters, a quatrain. That's very brief, but we will today go a little bit deeper than the surface to have a discussion. I would invite you to join the discussion what this poem reminds you of. But first, let's get into each line word by word. Let's read together. If I can move this slide. All right, so I will read twice. I will pause after each character and please read after me and then we will read the line together. 好的,准备好了吗?我会一个字一个字的读。然后再读整句,好吗? 好的，春，春，绵，绵，不，不，绝，绝，小，小，春绵，不绝晓，不绝晓。
True. 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 When. When. Tea. What tea? Meow. Tea. Meow. True. True. When tea. Meow. When tea. Now. True. True. When tea. Now. Yeah. 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 Lie. 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 Fung. 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 You. Shang. 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 Yeah, lie. Fung. Shang. Fung. Shang. Hua. Hua. Wo. Luo. Luo. Zhi. Zhi. Duo. Duo. Shao. Shao. Hua luo. Zhi duo shao. Hua luo. Zhi duo shao. 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 我可以听见有一些朋友读的, uh, I can hear some, which is fine, because, well, I, I, I don't hear a lot, and there's no echo, so I, we just, like, keep it on. Uh, and also, if we get to the breakout session, I would encourage everyone to uh, open your um, speaker and mic, and we can hear you if we get there. I know I'm a broken <laughs> record. <laughs> because we, we rarely get to that point. Um, but I, we will try today. 好的,那我们一起读一遍整首诗,好吗? So let's read the entire poem together from the title. 从题目开始。春晓 春晓春晓 春眠 不觉晓 I just want to emphasize this 雨 Mm -hmm. This this is not a this is a u sound. So you want to this y is a e. So you want to really move your lips from e to u. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's pause here for a moment just to look into the poem together as it is a very brief quatrain. Um, many of us know quatrain means four lines, and this is a pentasyllabic quatrain, five characters each line, instead of a heptasyllabic, which will have seven characters each line. So this is almost the shortest poem that you can find in classical Chinese poetry. Pentasyllabic quatrain, Wu Yan Jueju. On the surface, it's a very simple poem. So, by looking at the characters and also the translation, can someone just share what you can tell from this poem? Anyone want to try? You can open your mic. 有没有人愿意分享 
你觉得这首诗说了什么？嗯，我觉得他说，呃，他在睡觉，然后他听见鸟的声音，他就起床，看见呃落下的呃的花儿，嗯。Very good, thank you, Xiao An. Thank you. So it's a, it's a simple poem. On the surface, it's someone wake up in a spring morning, and and also sort of in between、um, waking up a dream and a reality. So it's a little bit in a state of the semi consciousness. We all have this experience early in the morning, waking up, and especially now it's spring. Does that remind you some of the mornings, how、mm -hmm. you feel before you get out of the bed and <laughs> emails and lunch and learn and all of that, right? Shall. Mm hmm. Chun shall spring morning. Chun. So the poem. When. That's what. On the surface. Now I would. Oh, I can hear somebody is reading the poem. That's fine. Yeah. Now it's good. So now, if we look just slightly more closely, we may find there is a hidden timeline here. With four lines, the poet plays with three different states of time. The present, sorry, the past, the present, and the future. Do you agree? Yes. And if you do, I can see Len Lenny. Yeah. So can you can you share? Can you point out the lines referring、yeah. to the three states of?、Uh, you have.、Um... Uh, well, what I first thought was、uh, the end was for sure the the future.、Um, uh, going back, actually, I thought also of people dying. <laughs>、uh, how many people have died? But anyway, and will die. So the the first line, "Chu Chu Wen Qi Mao Niao Niao," is、uh, the first stage, and then. Um, the second state is the second line, and then comes something that is a little more、um, pessimistic.、Uh, nights, um, the um,、uh, the year life from Yu Xing, where、uh, and Hua Luo Zhi Duo Xiao. The two last lines kind of hang together for me. Where this is a little bit more dark, and that's why I got to think about this: <laughs>、uh, how、mm -hmm. many petals have fallen. So that's my thoughts.、Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Thank you. Chinese. That's too difficult for me in Chinese to say the explanation. So. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, that's actually one、um, I feel I want to share because the the poem, or any poems, well, it's it, it offers an opportunity to evoke your own experiences and your understanding and feelings. So it could be interpreted very differently from one to the other.、Um, and thank you for for sharing that. And then that also like what when you mentioned, 花落知多少 Ah,、uh, it's not only about the flowers, but could be. Uh, related to lives that could be falling,、uh, that's something that, as well, we are reading the news and everything that could be a really relevant、uh, feelings and understanding to make.、Um, yeah, thank you. And anyone, anyone else want to share?、Uh, this is Karen.、Um, so I was wondering. So as I read this poem, it kind of because I had. I couldn't sleep last night, so it kind of evokes a sense of insomnia, of you know, of all these things that would, you know, all these disturbances,、um, and that's what it reminded me of.、Mm -hmm. I, 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 yeah, Ray. Yeah, I would just like to build a little bit on what Lenny said because looking at the last line, I think the time is ambiguous, and it could be the future. 
because the night sounds are the wind and rain that are coming and by the morning petals will fall. How many? So starting with the morning, we have the spring nap, <clears throat> unconscious of the dawn, which has already happened. Every word bird song, the present, night sounds will come, the wind and rain will blow down, uh, obviously the petals. So I see a whole progression of whatever circularity of time or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. Anyway, well, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's 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 right to the point. All of all of your uh, interpretations really it's an interweaving of time that uh, while the first line it's to make it clear that it's a spring waking up uh, after a night and then the dawn is coming and then you hear the birds chirping all over. That's the present while uh, you're waking up and then thinking about the, the night, whether you're awake or not, whether it's a dream, wh whether the, the, the feng yu, the, the sounds of wind and rain, are they in your dream or are they, <coughs> were, were they the reality during the night? It's sort of, there is an, an ambiguity there, which is intentional. And then triggering the question, hua luo zhi duo shao? Uh, which could be uh, found out if you step out. So that answer is in the future, while what happened could be at night, in a dream or not. So there's a lot yeah. of ways to interpret that and also to relate to how I mean, you uh, experience uh, and feel. Yeah. May I, may I uh, also add something? Sure. Uh, who's speaking? <clears throat> this is Anthony. Oh, hi, Anthony. Yes, please. Hi. So uh, what I also notice is that there's a contradiction between the second and third lines. You know, when you say everywhere bird song, it's when you hear that, usually the day's open, the day's clear, the morning's bright. And then in contradiction to that, you have night sounds, wind and rain. So, you know, within this this also kind of uh, ambiguity of time and different time states and dream states and semi-conscious states. There's also kind of um, a, a disjointedness or contradictions or at least some kind of sense of conflict because night sounds, wind and rain, you know, the first part is sort of uh, the first two lines set up as something pleasant, you know, uh, quiet, um, musical, and then the second part, the last two, seem to be in contradiction to the first two, or at least in conflict with the first two. So it's not, it's, um, the, it's almost like yin and yang in some ways, you know, you have the two aspects of it. Well, thank you, Anthony, for bringing it up, the, the whole yin and yang um, contrast within every Chinese classical poem, I would say that's a very important concept. You're always looking for yin and yang and the contradiction or conflict or contrast because that's making the dynamic within the universe that this poem is creating or any poem is creating in classical Chinese tradition. So within these four lines, 20 characters, the poet is creating this kind of contrast while there is this calming and peaceful or maybe a little bit, um, well, depending on how you interpret it, right? It's disturbing that the birds, are they disturbing or are they providing a pleasant morning waking up call versus the, the night? And there are other actually contrast or yin and yang dynamics. And I, I want to point out shortly, <clears throat> uh, but also as well, we are already getting into uh, the, this is not just about waking up in the morning in the spring. So let's say, how about if Chun, because it's in the title, if Chun spring here is not just a spring, but more general about time, because well, poems are full of symbolic meanings, 
I can hear someone speaking. Are you commenting on something? So I have, as, <clears throat> oh, I have a that? question. It's funny, I've got your poem on my screen. This is my first time. Your poem is on the screen. I can see your face. I don't see my own, but that's not necessarily important. As I wrote on the chat, I had a very dark association. I'm very upset by the, the introduction of a war that's going on. So I saw the contradictions as for the people in Ukraine, as I've been reading in one of the newspapers, that everything was going quite nicely and people seemed positive and were going on with their lives. Everywhere is bird song, but in the night, there could be sounds of war as if it's a metaphor for night sounds, wind and rain, war and destruction, and how many petals fallen could be a question for people who are hiding and wonder how many of their fellow citizens have fallen. And so in my question on the chat, I was curious as to when this poem was written, what was going on in history at that time? Were there wars or were there always wars? And this was a com common. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a scholar, so I do not know details of Tang history and of course Chinese people are always referring back to the past and maybe earlier Tang or earlier times. I know this is very I, lengthy on my part and if you don't want to address it, that's okay. Oh, thank you, uh, Eugenia, for bringing it up because well, as well, we are living in this time and it is apparently one of the I have to say, um, we, we, even though this poem may provide a short and a brief escape for all of us, but well, it's, it's something the war and what's happening in the world is waiting on our mind and our heart. Uh, so I think it's quite relevant and actually really relevant well, for this poem. Look at these two words, feng and yu talking about symbolic meanings. It's not just the feng and the yu in nature. It really, in Chinese language, feng yu means the ups and downs, and especially the downs, the tragedies that one could experience, big and small, in life. So usually, we will literally use feng yu as a metaphor for hardships in lifetime. It's um, as the uh, speaking of how this poem, when was it written, how the Tang Dynasty environment socially or historically was, Meng Haoran was uh, in early Tang Dynasty. So we, we, I don't know exact circumstance how he was composing this poem for, but during his lifetime, China or Tang Dynasty was experience, experiencing a relatively peaceful time, but the early Tang Dynasty was not that stable because it came from a very short-lived uh, Sui Dynasty before it was established in, I believe, uh, early eighth century. Uh, so the, and there was for the first, I would say two or three emperors, there were, there were quite some internal uh, fights among the royal families to establish the, uh, the throne. And as well, some of you may well know, even the first uh, women emperor, the Empress Wu, Wu Zetian, uh, was, uh, was, was reigning uh, in early Tang Dynasty, even though she contributed a lot to the thriving of Tang Dynasty afterwards. Um, but 
there was quite some dark time uh, within the court, within the royal family, and that could affect how a poem or a poet like Meng Haoran relates to the world. Uh, Meng Haoran himself was trying to um, establish his own career in the court unsuccessfully, and he then retreated uh, to a life that was more resembling Tao Yuanming and some of the great uh, 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 poets or scholars in China's history uh, that is mainly keeping a distance from the world or from the, uh, the so-called official uh, life uh, to pursue that kind of success. Um, and of course, there, there, there are plenty of wars in China's long history that one can relate to. And whether it's one's personal experience or in general related to the history to feel sorry or to feel relevant, related to all the souls and lives, uh, this could be what this poem is offering. Uh, so I, I hope that's addressing and uh, Eugenia, what yes. you mentioned and thank yes. you for that. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one thing I, I just want to, uh, maybe as well we are talking about this, I want to suggest another layer that's quite different because uh, while well, we mentioned the Chun, we mentioned that this could be related to life and a life experience because Chun is the first season of the year. It's the beginning of the year. So symbolically, Chun is always associated with life beginning and life with the potential to thrive. So what if, let me suggest another layer based, built up upon this. It's not only just about the beginning of life that's usually associated with youth in general, but more specifically about youth of women. Because there's hua, hua luo zhi duo shao, hua there, flowers, could be closely associated with the feminine force. Mm -hmm. As we talk about yin and yang here. So I would ask, can you agree or can you see there is a masculine force in this poem? If hua is symbolizing the feminine force, what is symbolizing or could symbolizing the masculine force in this poem? Uh, I think it's the birds, the birds calling maybe. Sometimes mm -hmm. like birds do that when they want to mate and sometimes it's male birds that do that maybe to attract females. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's fun. Yeah, it's Okay, so we have Niao, Xiao An, Xie Xie, and then we have Feng. Feng. Well, both yeah, characters, Feng. both characters in the title have the sun as part of the character, and that is a young uh, symbol. Mm. Uh, which character you're talking about? Fun and Xiao both have Zhi, mm -hmm. which is the yang symbol. 对的, 对的. Yeah, Xie Xie. Yeah, so thank you. We all we all can see there there are a lot of um, so Hua as one of the feminine force here, right? And Niao and Feng both are quite masculine. You are right. I personally would more associate with Niao and Hua as a pair, sort of feminine and masculine force, and Feng would be the masculine force versus Yu as the feminine force. And even if you hear that, the sound, the pronunciation, the tone, feng being high up there, high pitch, and yu being low pitch, that would even tone-wise provide that kind of uh, opposite forces. 
But, and then uh, does, that, one, does that work uh, in the mm -hmm. speech of the Tang period, though? That's Mandarin, which wasn't really around then. You are right, because well, we can only know exactly how it's pronounced now. But as well, we are reading it now, it has a tradition coming from the Tang Dynasty. Well, to the fact, to the effect of today. So we would have to think that the, the way that's carrying the pronunciation would work to continue that tradition of oppositing the high and the low sound to make that um, uh, the yin and yang going on there. And sometimes while well, we will read a poem that it doesn't really rhyme, so that would be raising the question whether the current sound would be exactly as what, this, what it would be sounded in Tang Dynasty. Yeah. How the, so, and the last point, as um, someone mentioned, Chun, we can see there is a song as well. We wrote the character last session. There is, there is a song literally within the character of Chun here, Chun here. Chun. And then Xiao, you can see it's, a, it's longer and a slimmer, but it's still a song there. Yeah. And that's also the, um, the masculine or the yang force present in this poem. Last but not least, I just want to mention one, I, I want to point out one unique trait of Chinese classical poem, the ellipsis of the pronoun. As well, we read this poem, as many other poems we have read, there is no I, no you, no he or she or it, nothing like a pronoun in the poem even though it could be implied. We could say it's the poet saying, I wake up in the hey. spring morning. I hear, I'm it's thinking worried. about the wind and it's rain. The, the, and it's I am wondering. Oh. However, what does it make you feel without the pronoun? Does it make a difference? Uh, yeah, because it feels like it could be yourself, like you are thinking it, you are the person. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, precisely. It is one of the, I would say, quite unique in Chinese classical poems, that without a clear pronoun, the poet or the poem is inviting you as the reader to be in the poem, to be in his dream at this, in this dream, at this, in this, po in this case, so that it could be more direct, not as a reader, but as somebody who's immersed in that state, him or herself. So when we look at the translation, sometimes it may be necessary to add a pronoun but I can see in this translation, the translator is trying very hard not to add any pronoun, even though that could be the case for English as a language wise. I'd like to also suggest that in that this form, it offers an expression of the human condition of how human beings experience life on earth that we wake up from a nap and maybe the birds are singing, but we also experience the, the night sounds and perhaps might have the thought, especially in spring, gee, have the petals fallen. So it's, it, it could be us personally or the poet personally, but it's something that everyone Ex, ex, has the possibility of experience, experiencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's opening, it's sort of like triggering. It's a, it's a trigger or it's a start. He offers that 
opportunity and potential, right? Yeah. That's the beauty of Chinese poetry that it functions on so many levels at the same time. Exactly, exactly. Marilyn. Yeah, I was interested that uh, Eugenia asked about Meng Haoran, the poet's background. And um, it made me remember that, shouldn't we consider the Anushan, the rebellion? Anushan was, uh, I believe it's after Meng Haoran. 755, I just looked it up. Oh. So it's toward oh, the I end of his life. Oh, okay. And depending on when Meng Haoran wrote this poem, he may have had feeling of the dynasty coming to a disturbing end. Uh, well, whatever. Feng Ye Lai, it's active. It's not that it's already fallen, night has fallen, but um, in the, to me, it's a very active Ye Lai, Feng Yusheng. It could be present and future. Maybe someone else has said this already. Mm -hmm. And the Hua Luo, is also um, past, present, and future. It's actually a very <laughs> pregnant phrase, the last one. Yeah, mm -hmm. really deep. Thank you. Indeed. Listen. Okay, Anthony. Yeah, after Anthony, we have to move on to the okay. writing part. <laughs> well, I think the other thing about the, the absence of all these uh, pronouns and ellipses and with the ellipses, is it's a whole aesthetic of uh, simplicity in space that you see also in the paintings mm -hmm. and the whole concept of, you know, reducing everything to their essence. Exactly. And there's a lot of connections and aesthetically and philosophically between Chinese poetry, painting and music. So I, I often think that even just looking at this poem, it's a embroider that waves the symbols, the colors, the images together and with music sound that it creates. So it really shows even uh, with layers of meanings and layers of senses that a Chinese poem can trigger all sorts of different feelings and different connections. Yeah. So we cannot go through everything within one hour, especially we want to have a few minutes to write a character together. Um, but before that, let's read this one more time together. How ma? Oh. 春晓春晓孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然春眠不觉晓春眠不觉晓孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟浩然孟
你觉得你们觉得它是什么字 ？Can you guess what character it is? 我觉得是花字。This is a it's a Xiao Zhuan. It's the the form that in Eastern Han Dynasty, about 100 A.D. That's the form of the character. That someone already said it. Chun, Chun. Oh, we did Chun last time. Chun is not Hua. Yeah. So you can you can tell actually well Chinese character is known to be pictographic. Not one of them are pictographic, but this one I feel is is quite um, to the image of a flower, and you can maybe like when I'm looking at it, I'm thinking about this is it could be the root coming out from the ground, growing up, and you have the leaves, and then you have the opening flowers or. More thriving young leaves on the top, and it is the flower that's opening up. And this could be also like the stem, the petal that's holding up the flower up there. Stroke order. Stroke order is important.、Mm, how to figure that out? How to figure that out? <laughs> so this this question was raised quite a few times as we were we are going through、um, writing like Xiao Zhuan, right? This is the seal style Xiao Zhuan.、Uh, I had said that it does not exactly following the stroke order of the current form, which is quite different.、Mm. Let me show you. This is one that I wrote.、Uh, This is the current version, right? Oops, the current version. Yeah, these two are quite different. So for Xiao Zhuan, even though it does not really follow strictly the stroke order of the current version, I would say it's still the general rule. From top to bottom, I would do left and right, and also we rarely have any stroke that would go from the bottom up, except for like maybe a T. You you push down and then you just like do a tick like that. But other than that, everything is pretty much trying to do it from the top to the bottom. So let's. Write this together. I will show how to write, and if you have your pen and paper, we can do this together. Can you see this?、Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So I will do the top first. The short line, and then the left part first. I'm using a pen, which is not a brush, because I cannot do this in like really as a calligrapher. But this, I hope, would show you how to write it. And if you are interested, there, there, there is still quite a lot of learning and practicing to do. So I will do this. But still, it requires one breath and one stroke. For me, the right one. It's repeating. Keep the balance. And I will do this. There is a short line there, and then going down. Yeah, this doesn't supposed to be there. It's supposed to be making the connection really smooth. I'm doing something you're not supposed to do here. <laughs> And then the leaves to me. Do the left one. The right one.
So even with this pen, with a soft brush at the tip, it takes quite some control of the fingers and wrist to keep the lines even and balanced. And then this is a longer, give a little bit of space. And then I push it too hard. So you can see this, this is like darker and stronger uh, compared to the lines on the top. But for Xiao Zhuan, it's better to be every line is quite even and balanced. And that's this the, seal style of Hua. The vertical stroke in the middle mm -hmm. seems to me the difficult one because <laughs> in general, the principle is zuo yo, mm -hmm. shang xia. But in that vertical stroke, um you you've added something and at what point is the vertical more important than the pangbian ne ne ba ge xiao xiao zhe ge you mean these small ne ge ne ge zui 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 zhong yao ne ge zhong jian huo zhe pangbian zui zhong yao meaning more important i In would say all the Lines are important in terms of balancing. Uh huh. If you I see. The little side ones first, then the center one is very hard to balance. Whereas if you write the center stroke first, then the side strokes can come along. Right. I did the center one first. That's precisely for the reason. Okay. Uh, because I I feel precisely if I want to do this character, I want to do the center one first. And then I did the this okay. side because it would define the space. Yeah, yeah. And then I have the sides on each side. But the top, I did the left first and the right second mm -hmm. because it's on top of the the center one. If the center one, there are some characters go through, like from the top to the bottom. And then I would do the center one first instead of the left one. Hmm. But this this center line seems to be underneath the top part. As well, we see this simplified version. So this version appeared, I believe, around 300 or 400 AD during the southern and the the, uh, the southern and northern dynasties. Uh, it's not the earliest form for flowers in Chinese. Um, as well, during that time, they start to pick this character to differentiate from this one, because this one today, it's the character for Hua. It's this, um, I would do the um, traditional style and you can see some resemblance there so you will have hua instead of that they become two oh yeah okay yeah hold on one second um Oops, this one is, yeah, this is Hua. This is what, what this character later 
This is the Xiaozhuan version, and this is more of the traditional style of the regular version. That's and where it's interesting because uh yeah yeah this is more of the current um the regular traditional form for hua because it still has the meaning the um it still can mean flowers but it's rarely used today and it also has the meaning of some the especially talking about plants or flowers thriving to describe the kind of um the the, the 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 blossom of the flowers or something like a flower that that is blossoming and during the southern and northern dynasties well it becomes uh this hua replaces replaced hua to be more specifically for flowers so it's an evolution of Chinese characters that throughout the history, uh, the characters could drop or add meanings and as what well we are inherited today. Also, the tone is different, right? Hua right. And hua. Right. Well, the hua is what, what we are pronouncing it mm -hmm. today. Um, and in in, in Mandarin, in standard Mandarin. And then in, so while the tones are not introduced to China until around that time, actually, it's after the, sen, um, the Sanskrit, uh, after the Buddhist scripts. Uh, but, be, but throughout the history, it's in, even in different regions, we are still pronouncing it differently. Um, yeah. Does it mean China like Hua Mai? Hua. Yeah. China or yeah, when we when we say not as a state, but as a as a geographic or cultural um meaning wait, I'm moving that Zhonghua means China too, not the state as Zhongguo, but this is Zhonghua. Like in the long name, Zhonghua Zhen Min Gong Like for exactly. the. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Zhonghua. I can remember that much easier. <laughs> right. Because it implies the great flourishing of the culture, too. That's is usually it? Zhonghua is more associated with like culture. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And then when we say Zhongguo, of course, it has uh, multiple meanings as well. Um, but when we refer to the state, it's Zhongguo, it's, or Zhonghua Renmin Gonghe Guo, as Xiao An mentioned, that's the longer version. Yeah. Okay, well, we are already passing one o'clock. I know some of you may go, but if you want to stay, we can write the Hua together, uh, the simplified version. So this one, in terms of stroke order, you have the top and then you do this is today still pretty much similar to this when you see this when you see this and today you see this it's pretty much means it has something to do with plants or vegetables or um uh, the flowers. And then and then I would do this. And then So that's the hua we are using today. The bottom part on itself, it's also a character, hua. Meaning like change, like 变化. 
变化, it means change, it means transform. So when you think about that, there is a reason why this becomes the character for Hua, because a flower truly is quite of a transformation of a plant. So last but not least, I want to share, um, I want to go back to the to the slide. I came across this. Uh, let me see gallery. I came across this poem in English by Emily Dickinson. Um, that I want to share. It's right here. It's about bloom, about flowers. I find there are, even though it's not in Chinese character, there are quite some images that well, we can draw from this poem as a comparison or for some further thoughts. And that's it for our lunch and learn this time. How the Oh, here is the slide. I moved it to a different place. Yeah. 好的,所以我们下一次, our next Lunch and Learn will be April 1st. Next month, 还是星期五, uh, 我希望能够再次见到大家, and please do register for that one, because I think the system is, a, is quite weird. You have to register every single time. I hope we could do better, but yeah, 谢谢大家,很高兴, uh, and see you next time. 谢谢老师,再见. Uh, 再见, 再见, 再见. 再见. 再见.